This week, event MC, TEDx speaker, and lion attack survivor Dan Ram and I came up with three sketches. It would be kind of lame if you got bit by a mosquito and you turned into Mosquito Man. And like, what does that look like? How do you annoy? If you were Mosquito Man and you stop a criminal from doing something, what is it you're doing? Now, this one's real softball, real easy. What would you do if you were the advisor to the other person who shares really tiny hands? Obama goes in for the fist bump and you think he's hitting him. Which one did we pick? You'll find out on this episode of... It's a Sketch Comedy Podcast Show. Welcome to Sketch Comedy Podcast Show, the one-of-a-kind show where I, Stuart Rice, invite interesting people to have intriguing conversations and then improvise a comedy sketch based on what was talked about. Visit sketchcomedypodcastshow.com to subscribe, get links, buy merchandise, and even apply to be on the show. Enjoy the show. We enjoyed making it. Thank you so much for listening. When you were a kid and went out for a walk, you might have attracted mosquitoes or flies. Not Dan Ram. Dan attracted lions. Dan Ram is an accidental event master of ceremonies, has given TEDx talks five times, and can even show you how to get yourself doing the same thing as a coach. He has met celebrities of all sorts, including being on stage with Barack Obama, who actually remembered his name, even if Dan mispronounced his. We hear about Dan's childhood run-in with a giant kitty, which is only one of four near-death experiences he has had. We get to hear how he accidentally found success through a massive failure, which has led to hundreds of speaking engagements, TEDx talks, and he has even been an advisor to the Irish Prime Minister. When not touring the globe, emceeing events, or giving talks, Dan helps others live their lives to their fullest through coaching, and you can find out more about that at IamDanRam.com. This week's sketch, Should I Shake or Should I Go, follows the conversation. And now, my conversation with Dan Ram, event MC, TEDx speaker, and lion attack survivor. Dan. Yes. What makes you interesting? Ooh. Well, here's something that most people will not give you as an answer. I've survived a lion attack. And I think that makes me interesting. That's a good start. Tell us about a lion attack. What? What? Yeah, exactly. What? What is the accurate response to that? I was 16 years old. I was on a school field trip in Zimbabwe where we were living. My dad was posted there because he's the diplomat, uh, the ambassador for India at that point. And so it was an annual school trip. Every year was somewhere different. Sometimes it was on horseback. Sometimes it was sailboats. Sometimes it was some kind of wildlife reserve. And this one particular time. We were exploring different man-made islands on a man-made lake. And so each island has animals. We don't know what animals are on them. And so off you go for a little walk and explore and starts off with nice little zebras and giraffes and wildebeest. The occasional they start you off so easy, don't they? They always exactly. start so easy. Exactly. Go ahead. And then before you know it, we're just going for casual walk, me and seven other girls, plus an English teacher. The rest of the team were cleaning the boats and doing other duties and projects. And um, yeah, and then the lioness came out. Okay, so as a lioness, and she's like, you're the one dude. I'm going to go after you. <laughs> No, uh, what <laughs> happened was you hear it before you see it. And I think implanted in every biological organism is a fight or flight, a survival instinct. Because you it don't is the basic, to, it's the root of our brains is the that yeah. exact thing. Yes. You don't need to practice or rehearse a lion attack. You just instinctively know this is a bad situation. And that was one of those ones because I have not previously been around lions close enough to know now's the time to start running. 
And so it just happened. So we were walking, chit-chatting as teenagers do, but quietly because we realized, you know, we're in a wild space and anything can happen. To be fair, the guide who was leading us did tell us, oh, I can smell lions, but who can smell lions? So we didn't take it too seriously, right? And so we start walking in very thick bush. This isn't like the Serengeti. It's not like Kenya and the, and the images you might have of Africa from that. It's really, really thick bush. And so we're walking through navigating. And what you hear all of a sudden is like twigs and branches breaking, being destroyed very quickly as a animals rushing at you. And then you hear something that is like, a cat except maybe a thousand times lower decibel and um it almost makes the ground shake and so you're just hearing this sound coming at you and immediately you i go, feel like i would have that sound coming out of me if i heard that <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, go, it go, so go ahead so so you get the sound and uh, then all of a sudden fill us in give, give us the rest of it so, so then uh, uh, everybody's body has the same reaction and goes, I have to get out of here really quickly. And so that's what everyone did except my body. My body malfunctioned and when could not compute, overload. And so my body just stayed stationary and all the other bodies started running. And um, the guide yells out, stop. And it's in one of those situations again not a lot of com- computing and there's not a lot of processing of uh, information right. and so if he had said uh, sing a song we would have all started singing um if he had said fly we would have learned to fly in that moment because he said stop we didn't we didn't overthink it everyone just stopped i had already stopped thank goodness i had done the right thing by not moving in the first place and that is when everyone has stopped that the sound rushing at us also stopped and for the first time, you could see through the bush this brown figure. And then it starts approaching us really slowly. And then you see the head, you see the teeth, you see it being really upset that you're in its space. The eyes right. walk in to every single person. And that's when the stare down begins. And it's essentially, you know, the game chicken? It's like, who's going to move first? Yeah, you because know, whoever turns around and runs, they are dinner and so each person is just really still i don't think we even remembered to breathe during that time i think we just we're just standing there as as close to statues as possible and the line is sizes each up one by one down the line uh including myself and was waiting for one of us to turn around when we didn't, so it felt like a couple of days, but it probably was a few minutes that we had the stare down. And then she lay to the ground. And that's one of two things. Either she was not interested in pursuing us or she was tricking us. Hard to tell. Uh, and so we chose not to take a chance to keep just stand our ground. And so there she was on the ground laying. And again, for Linus to jump that I don't know, uh, 12 feet that was between us, um, effortless. Uh, and so yeah. we just watched and watched and watched and watched. And, um, and then very slowly we started backing up. Of course, anytime someone would gasp or audibly breathe, we would stop and freeze because you'd see her ears twitch and, you know, oh, or if a twig snapped underneath our feet, and so that's what happened. And, and so eventually, slowly, we, we came out of the, the bush area into the clearing. And that's when the male lion came running out. And he just came <laughs> to the show. He just came running out. Uh, big mane, big muscles, uh, big paws. Uh, kind of did this um, mock attack roar. So it's not like one of those things on Lion King where it's like, hello, I'm the king. It's more like, get out of here, kind of roar. And then, and it ran away. So that was the lion attack. Uh, thankfully, not close enough to have claw marks on my chest. Otherwise, I'd be just be walking around shirtless all day long to show it off. Um, oh, yeah. But- I mean, that's that, if you get bit by a, a shark, 
You yeah. purposely tailor clothing so that you can show the shark attack. If you've Absolutely. got slashes across you because you got attacked by a lion or a lioness, doesn't really matter. You definitely cater. It's like, you know, like when Iron Man has his thing in the front, like he always shows uh-huh. it off. You do that with the lion attack. That way, everybody knows you what, what kind of a badass you are. So a lot of people would would do like if I if that happened to me, curl up in a in a corner, cry for a little bit. What did you do with it? You tell us about what you do. So how do you how do you actively show that that lion attack from your when you were 16? (laughs) Well, here's the thing, right? I think everything in life, the good and the bad, the uh, positive situations, the negative situations form us, make us who we are, mold us, shape us. And so I have used that same line attack to teach business tips at uh, the universities where I'm an adjunct lecturer. I've used it to motivate people to seize the day and live because you don't know what line's coming at you in life. Because we were just having casual teenage chats until then. None of us were preparing to die or to uh, see our life flash before eyes that day. And that can happen like someday this all ends for every one of us maybe not with a lion but with someone so whether it's motivational talks whether it is uh confidence and charisma because a lot clicks in when you're in those moments of i'm about to die and that was only one of four near-death experiences not including two death um well let's call it two life-threatening situations last year so i've had like six situations where i've kind of been like on the cusp of it a lot clicks in as far as priorities and values. And so I help people with figuring out what is their purpose? What is their mission as a coach? So what I do nowadays is I'm a speaker, I'm an event host, and I am a coach. And the story does come up maybe like five to six times a year. I do about a hundred speaking engagements. So I do have an arsenal of other stories as well, but I do like the line, sir, because it is something a little bit different, right? What have you been attacked? Yeah, by that's definitely. I, I've, I, mosquitoes Mos- during the oh. summer it's mosquitoes not quite the same level of threat uh, way more irritating wait 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 so one of my um life-threatening situations last year was with a mosquito because i got bitten what? by some kind of mosquito called uh that gave me dengue and it's the second time i've got dengue in my life so the first time was okay it was indonesia you know your body's fine the second time 10 years later um, actually can cause more complications. So I was in the hospital and I lost tons of weight, could not eat anything, had terrible fevers and joint pain. And it is terrible. So don't be okay. little. You know, right. Could take you out. Could take you out. No, probably not because I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, ours are probably not as life threatening when, uh, you know, they're, they're really just annoying. They could annoy me to death. That but sound, I'm not going to get dengue. That sound, right? That is like one of the most terrible sounds because uh, you, you Yeah, but you can't always see it. And so you're just punching in the air, hoping to right. grab it. And everyone thinks they can, you know, just catch it out of thin air or mid air while it's flying and it's not possible. So then you start like clapping all over the place. And right. You're, you're, essentially, you're applauding this thing because it's winning. I mean, usually, that's a good point like you're walking around cla- clapping and the mosquitoes like well I, I guess i should just keep doing this just you seem keep to like it. it this guy <laughs> like it. yes exactly Although so you we, are a coach oh sorry go ahead go ahead we we have an electric bat that we use so it's a little bit unfair advantage but i'm a tennis player and a badminton player and so that really helps as i well electrify the uh the they die I'm just trying to see. Wait, you have an electric badminton racket that you (laughs) swing around at the like that's what's nice. You got some distance. You got some reach if you do it right. Exactly, and larger surface area than the palm of my hand, and so uh, there's a higher chance of killing these things. And sometimes you catch them, and then you open your palm, and then bam, it flies off again. Not with this. Um, This just makes it into barbecue. Satisfying zap, I'm sure varies like i've been bitten and especially when you get bitten at the bottom of your feet i don't know if you've had that or like somewhere you know, it's hard where it's like you're tickling yourself but you're actually trying to scratch uh, the itch and it's it's terrible mosquitoes are terrible sometimes mosquitoes i wonder why terrible. god created mosquitoes I mean, there's a bunch of stuff 
I understand, you know, the symbiosis and the connection between a species and how it keeps the world going together. But mosquitoes, what are they doing? <laughs> they don't do anything good. As far as I know, they don't. I don't no. know any animal that depends on mosquitoes to survive and where mosquitoes enhance like flower production or so. Like, I don't know what they do. No, no, no. It's not like if you get bit by a mosquito, it's possible you can turn into like a, a vampire. A bat will do that, right? I don't know. Spiders, you could be radioactive. You could have Spider Man powers. No one's mosquito, dude. No one's, you know, but, but no one cares. Anyway. Um, yeah. Yes. So now, now you, you, you do TED Talks. You do a lot of speaking engagements. Lots. How did you get into that? By accident. But I also think um, maybe like your own story, Stuart, because I know you've been doing this now for five seasons, right? You've, you've been doing the... Uh, <laughs> yes. The, Successfully? Um, yeah. For, for been, a while. It's been five years. Yeah. Well, I think, I think when you choose to figure out what does the world need? What can I offer to solve that need? Am I good at it? And can I get paid to do it? When these four things are true, then it locks in. I think life alignment happens. And so these are my four guiding principles during any season of my life, including right now during a pandemic at the time that we're shooting this um, interview, this conversation that we're having, because life throws curveballs. And so you got to keep revisiting it. And so a couple of years ago, I had just finished successfully setting up a few businesses. I no more was needed at an executive level to be involved in my startups. We now had CEOs and COOs and the teams have grown. And I had successfully fundraised. And the way you can fundraise, one of the ways is to show up at these tech events and go, hey, investors, this is what we're building. Are you interested? And you're given like 60 seconds, 120 seconds to give a short pitch. The stage manager for one of those stages approached me the following year and said, Dan, your business did not raise money at the event. Your ideas are okay, but your communication skills and your stage presence is excellent. And given that you know the stage, would you be willing to MC the stage? And I asked her, what's MCing? And then she gave me the only training I've ever received in what has now become the best chapter of my life. And she said, well, you introduce startups and you engage the audience. And so that is what I've continued to do for the last three years. I've done 300 events on four continents, everything from blockchain to startups to uh, real estate to uh, autonomous vehicles, like a whole variety of topics. And it's always the same thing. I get to introduce some of the coolest people in the world from presidents of Switzerland and the US and Poland uh, to the CEOs of some of the biggest companies in the world, billionaire founders and investors to artists, Grammy winning artists to athletes, uh, Formula One champions and others, and get to engage audiences to elevate the knowledge, the aspiration, the focus, the tools and resources of everyday people that are trying to make a difference in their lives and getting to be that bridge. And that's what I do every day. And honestly, it is, I constantly pinch myself that this is my life because I cannot think of a cooler, cooler thing that I could be doing right now. It is so satisfying. It is so fulfilling. And even now when I look at, so my team, my social media team still keep posting images and I look at those images and go like, how could that be me? Like, this is insane. Like I am standing next to the newest fully electric Porsche car. Who is Dan Ram to do that? Like, that doesn't make any sense. That's me shaking hands with Obama about an interview. Like, how is that happening right now? This is super confusing. So I'm very grateful for my life. It's still yeah. true that. I am still like, whoa, this is crazy. It's not like, oh, I've done this 300 times and now this guy's like, you know, this is this new normal. This is not normal. I don't think my life is normal at all. And for that, I'm very grateful. Yeah, I, that sounds amazing. That's, that's incredible. And that came off of, I, I, what's interesting about that, that came off of a failure, if you think about it, right? Yeah, and you took that failure and you turned it around and made it into 
what what I would define as a very successful business doing something very very cool, right? Failure is essential. It is so key, yeah. man. And I have. I, I like people who have a linear view on life. I'm actually a little bit envious, a little bit jealous of them. You know, it's like, oh, this is my goal, and here are my steps, and here's how I'm going to do it. That does work for some people. I'm not putting that down at all. It's just not my story. And sure. I have realized that failure, that experimentation, that trial and error, notice error in trial and error, are yeah. all part of the left, right, pivot, uh, jump, fall back, and move again position. And I think that's what's allowed for the diversity of my life. Because the same guy, Dan Ram, was an advisor to the Irish prime minister at the national level, creating policies that affect millions of people and billions in GDP. I am an adjunct lecturer teaching entrepreneurship to university students, which is so exciting to be contributing to like the next generation of business people. I've been a startup founder. I've been a radio presenter. I work for the UN. I work for World Vision. I work for KPMG. Um, I am a consultant. I'm a coach. Like, That diversity of life, that traveling the world could not have happened if I was really pigeonholing my life and my purpose into this is my one goal. And that's the only thing I'm going to look at. I've looked to the left. I've looked to the right. I've taken a wrong step to the left. I've taken a good step to the right. And that's all part of it. So failure has been key in teaching me things, but also navigating me because I would not be on this path if it wasn't a bunch for failures along the way. So I completely agree with you. This started off as, as, as part of a failure. And I think a lot of my greatest moments, the origin was at a point of real struggle and real failure. Yeah. So you experienced that struggle. Uh, I mean, um, it, that, that, I mean, you, it, that turned around pretty quick for you, right? Like it was, hey, your company didn't make it. But uh, here, come talk to, up on the stage and, and see how that feels. And then all of a sudden, it happens for you. Um, what are, wait, what are wait, some wait, other... Wait, wait. <laughs> Go for know. it. Yeah, that's, like... yeah, that's I... where I'm going with it. Go for it. Tell me. Tell me about that. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Yes and no. Because, okay. Stuart, if someone came to you and said, um, you know, they watched this one interview, right, and, with, with Dan Ram, and they go, Man, you're so good at asking questions. Why don't you come and do a TV show? Someone's going to look at that and go like, well, that was quick. You just talked to Dan Ram and bam, you got it. But you've done five seasons of this. And before the yes. five seasons, you had other iterations and other versions. Like this is not the first time you have, you know, put a mic to your mouth. I'm sure there have been many other things on stage and off stage and practice and maybe all the way back in school. Because my journey as a speaker began where everybody's journey in life begins, where a teacher says, can you read this paragraph out aloud? And the problem was I wasn't good at that, right? Because I am Indian. So if you're listening to this podcast and you cannot visualize me, I'm not American, although I might come across as American. I'm Indian. I've got brown skin. I grew up on uh, what? three or four continents. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up on three or four continents. And so my accent adapted to every country. So when I was living in France, I had a French accent. When I was living in Morocco, I had a North African accent. When I lived in India, my accent became more Indian. When I moved to Zimbabwe, I had a Southern accent. So like the accent kept changing. So it wasn't cool. Like whatever words came out of my mouth were not fun to listen to. And my friends mocked me. Uh, or as they say in Ireland, they slagged me. Uh, they, they, they made fun of me. And so that was again a point of failure. And so what did I do? I would come back home. I would pre-read everything that a teacher could possibly ask me to read the next day. And that pre-reading simply meant that every day I was that much more prepared than the other students. And therefore my grades started going up again from a point of failure. And, but then it also meant that because I was practicing because I was not good at it, I became significantly better than those who took it for granted. They could just read the words as they appeared. Whereas I was already trying to figure out what is the sentence? Not what is a specific word and can I pronounce it correctly, but what's the sentence? What's the message behind this paragraph? Can I communicate that effectively? Or say in church, if you've ever been to church, uh, churches love getting Sunday school kids to be part of plays or theater or to read a Bible verse. And again, all the other kids would you know, have written out on a piece of paper and read it out. But because I was so afraid of mumbling or stuttering, 
I would memorize the entire verse and I would speak it. I would perform it. And I would not know that word at that, at that age, but I would essentially perform that reading. I would not just read. And so my journey began there from a same starting point as everyone else. But because I wasn't good at it, I put more effort at it. And because I put more mm-hmm. effort at it, I got better. I accelerated faster than others when it came to reading and performance. So then it became school plays and then it became performing on stage as a musician. And so when you think about 25 years of performance in the form of school plays and on the piano and singing in church and gospel choirs and uh, family events and youth groups and leading games, that's what happened. Now, the financial business opportunity came in three years ago, but it took all of that work. And that's why I keep telling people, never belittle an opportunity. Never right. underestimate a person or a connection or a door that opens because you really have no idea where it's going to take you. Some of my greatest moments have been in many ways on the surface accidental. But I would not have stepped into that opportunity if I hadn't done the work before that. Yeah, no, I completely agree. So I wrote a, uh, you know, I'm not, this is not an ad for me, but I wrote a book and people ask me like, how long did it take you? And it's like, well, the actual writing and editing took about six months, but it took me 25 years to rewrite this book. Yeah. Because, yeah. And, and to your point, it does not come as easy as other people see it. And there's a lot of. I, I think that story is amazing because again, it comes from a place of you were fail. Maybe you didn't allow yourself to fail, but it could have come from a failure from your friends making fun of you. You made sure you were prepped. It took extra work. The other work that quite honestly, I would have been sitting in class going, I'll just read the book. I'll just read whatever, which is pretty much what I did. So, yeah, that's why you excelled ahead of everybody. That's that's a fantastic story, man. I love it. You should do that for everything in life, right? So this is a really dumb example, but it'll prove a point. I was in soundcheck with a German group, and they were stressing about how they would shake hands with President Obama when he was about to come on stage. Because you're only given a few seconds and his team are very particular about what you can and cannot do. They had seen online that he sometimes does a fist bump with people. Um, They might have not been culturally woke enough to understand when he um, initiates a fist bump and when he doesn't. But they were really hopeful that they would do a fist bump, but they didn't know he was going to do a fist bump or what he was going to do. So when I walked up as part of the sound checks, they were doing everything from uh, air high fives to handshakes, to fist bumps, uh, to a variety of different things. And the reality is that moment became so insignificant and lost in the whole like hour that he spent on stage but they over fixated on it because it was the first time they thought about it. I, on the other hand, because my dad was a diplomat, I remember even the age of six or seven, he teaching me how to shake hands with people. Cause as a kid, I was not excused. So when another ambassador of another country comes to your house, you have to make eye contact. You have to smile and you have to shake hands and you got to have right pressure. When a dignitary comes to an official meeting, it doesn't matter if you're seven, if you're 10, if you're 12, you have to represent your nation. And so I was taught at a young age, all of those things. The beautiful part is when Obama came on stage, it wasn't the first time I was thinking about what I was going to do. And I, by then, had started perfecting not just how do I react, but how do I initiate or how do I create the atmosphere for things? So what was talked about with the event is a rather uh, clumsy interaction with the founders of the event. But for some reason, of all the people on stage, um, Obama sticks out his hand to shake my hand and then pats me on the back. And because he's mic'd up and I'm mic'd up, he's like, thanks so much, Dan. It's the only name he remembers on stage. And they're like, how did this foreigner who comes to Germany get this camaraderie with this person that the rest of us don't? But that's because, honestly, it was years 
and decades of shaking hands with people. And more than that, knowing, you know, what is your body language saying? Because you can initiate, and everyone's been in that situation where they have like gone for the handshake, someone's gone for the fist bump, but now you're like clawing their fist bump. And it's like, what am I, what are we doing? This is so embarrassing. Right. And, but a lot of that is like in the eye contact before you even get close enough. It, part of that is in the body language. You know, are you coming in for that bro hug or are you coming in right. for that standoff hand? Like a lot of that is in your body language. So I had moved from like shaking hands and fist bumps to body language and reading their body and reading my body and what is my body communicating. But even in the little, little things, I paid a lot of attention, which means that I don't have those clumsy exchanges on stage, which by the way, I find hilarious. And you as a performer, Stuart, you probably look at these things on, on, on YouTube as well, but I will often look at like performance failures or like stage, failures just to anticipate what could happen, what I should be thinking about. But I pay attention to all of those things. When I'm on stage, I can tell you where every monitor, where every light is, because right. I don't want to trip on those things. Right. Mm -hmm. and, other <laughs> right. and so they trip on them. And so, yeah, I, I would say in the little and the big things, Never underestimate an opportunity to train, to practice, to rehearse. The smallest things, eye contact, pronunciation, handshakes, body language, all the way to the biggest things like the, the actual words that you say or the audience that's in front of you or the content you want to share. Practice, rehearse, everything that looks chill and organic and spontaneous is actually decades of practice. Um, right. that's what comes out in the moment. Who, who do you look at and admire in, in their ability to do that? That is a really good question because I have struggled to find a direct role model in the world of emceeing. As many people would imagine, many people would have thought emceeing or hosting an event as a voluntary or an occasional job. I have managed to not just make it a full-time job, but to build a business around it. Like I have 12 staff that work for me. Uh, we do so much more than just emceeing. And so there is no school for emceeing. There is no training center for emceeing. And I don't know any direct role models of people that have been able to, I guess, make a, a business out of emceeing. Although many people have been in that position of emceeing, many people will chair a meeting or will uh, host a wedding of their friends or something. So they're in that position, but never in a professional setting of it. So what I do is I actually look at three different sources. Um, and I wonder if this may surprise you or not, but one of them are magicians. Cause I think magicians are incredible storytellers. They are incredible storytellers. After all, it's a trick. It's an illusion. The part that catches you is the story. So they are one source that I go to. Stand-up comedians, so much admiration for stand-up comedians because you can often, especially in your early days, enter into a hostile crowd. And you've got seconds. I mean, those audiences are expecting to laugh. That is a high standard to, to reach, especially if they don't know you. Now, if you reach the uh, heights of say Kevin Hart or any of these big guys, they'll get the laugh just by showing up on stage. They just have to make a funny. Uh, thing. Yes. Yeah. Pat Oswalt does a great bit on exactly that. Yes. But for early stage stand-up comedians, and that's why I watch those kind of stand-up comedians, like how do you turn a crowd around? And it's all around empathy. It's all around connection. So I love watching stand-up comedians. And the third unusual source are preachers. I listen to preachers because they have to come to the same crowd week after week and keep their attention. So it's almost the opposite of a stand-up comedian. But I think there's something about that cons consistency, that longevity of a pastor that over 15, 20 years can come to the same crowd and deliver something new. And to be such expert storytellers, to draw out value out of the same passages. I mean, no one's changing the Bible up every year. And so they have to draw new lessons from well-known passages. So those are the three unusual sources I go to. The obvious source I go to is a late night show TV host. And so Trevor Noah, I think, is the smartest when it comes to uh, unscripted content. I think he's intellectually the most profound uh, and he's also very articulate on the spot. 
I think Hasan Minaj is the most relevant right now, 21st century, his perspectives, his attitudes. He is very current in the way he communicates. I think people like Jimmy Fallon and uh, James Corden are very good with their sketches. So how do you take actors, actresses, and people who are very comfortable in a studio and make them feel comfortable in front of a live audience? Because it is a different art. And I don't think people realize how out of a comfort zone actors and actresses and their celebrities can be in a studio setting, in a, sorry, in a TV studio setting. It can be a very scary experience. And these guys are able to make them feel comfortable enough to have a good laugh or do an interesting sketch with them. And I like some of the creativity behind their games and their sketches. So these are some of the people involved um, in my world that I watch on a daily basis to just see how do they ask a question? How do they build that connection? What are they doing right. backstage? So that when they come on stage, they have that sense of warmth between these people. Yeah. How about you? Who, who do you look up to? Yeah, like- obviously, obviously, it's uh, it, it's very similar. Um, I, I I find uh, I, I I'll go back further. Um, uh, Dick Cavett. Like I really, if you go back and watch Dick Cavett, it's that's who I aspire to be. Like that guy always felt like he had rapport with whomever he was talking to. Yeah. And, uh, it, and he was very good on his own. Like he was very quick, quick witted. He's, I, I find he was really, really good. Um, but anybody who can really have a genuinely, it makes it look like it's a conversation, but a lot of times, like, you know, when you see a TV talk show host, they may not know the person they're talking to very well, but they've been prepped much to your point. They have been yeah. very well prepped so that when they do talk to that person, it's very natural. And I, uh, it's, it, it does have to have that like inviting into the conversation and uh, it, it inviting the audience as well. So like if, if they have something they want to say, for instance, there, someone posted up a comment. Uh, Devo put up mittens, and I don't know if what that has. Does that does that mean anything to you? Mittens? Mittens? No. Yeah. No. I okay. No <laughs> Maybe that was like someone had like, I've got dirt on him. Ask him about the mittens. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I'll ask. <laughs> no, no idea about mittens. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. Cause that I, I'm sure that could, you could have lied right there and you could have said, yeah, mittens. Let me tell you about that. And just launched right into a story. I well, can't. Should I tell you? Okay, about go for it. Yeah. Tell me about mittens. Cause I have a feeling like, wait, let me, let me pose it like this though. You know, Dan, you say a lot of things, but I have one statement that I, I feel you need to explain. Go on. And that is this mittens oh man i was really hoping you wouldn't bring this up but given this is a transparent vulnerable space i'm going to let you in on something mittens so i am a man i am five foot ten um i have a lot of things that i'm really great at and unfortunately i have one or two faults one of those faults I actually share with one of the most powerful people in the world right now. And I am so deeply embarrassed to confess this to you right now, but I have really tiny hands. And so it is true. The stories are true. I don't shop for mittens in the male section. I actually go to the children's section and I get a size four. Um, which also is the same size that the most powerful man in the world right now uh, wears. So this person has some good goss on me because they probably have seen me walking in a Zara, not into men's section, but into women's section. Because as, as an Indian, I'm often in these cold, freezing cold countries like Finland, Poland, and I need to wear mittens, you know? Uh, after all, I use yeah. my hands when performing. I use my hands when I'm playing the piano. I use my hands when I'm making gestures. And... I need them to be warm. So I wear mittens. Do you, do you play a smaller piano when you have tiny hands? I do. That too. Yes. Very <laughs> small. Very small piano. I actually play the one that's on my phone. Um, I do not play live-size pianos. I, I just pull out my phone and play that one. Yes. That's awesome. Thank you. 
All right. Well, it is time to do a sketch. Are you ready for this? I've got a couple of ideas. Do you, did, did you, by any chance, did you come with an agenda? Did you have a sketch agenda that you wanted to do? No, but I feel like I just did a sketch. So for anyone who's listening and thought that that was a real story, that is not a real story. I have normal size hands and I do not even own mittens. Never had to. So just to be 100% clear, Dan does not have small hands. He really wanted to make sure everybody understood his hands are normal sized. One quick ad for one of my new endeavors. I now record audiobooks professionally. I would love to give you a free copy and urge you to head to Audible to grab it. Just go to bit.ly scps snapshots to sign up and get this title for free as well as have access to hundreds of thousands of other titles to listen to. I'm proud of this audiobook. I did accents and I didn't suck. If you would like to get a copy of the book completely free, please email the show at sketchcomedypodcastshow.com and request a redeemable code for the book. Then you can tell me if I actually did suck at making those accents. And now, this week's sketch. Should I shake or should I go with Dan Ram? In three, two. And that concludes our panel discussion for this evening. Haha, <laughs> another perfect event. Little do they know that what makes me the greatest MC of all time is my secret ability to read minds that I got from that lion when I was young. I would like to thank all of our speakers. Sure, I could have used these powers to help the planet, but I helped the planet in the best way possible. By emceeing amazing events like this one. Beyonce, Dr. Anthony Fauci, presidential hopeful Kanye West, Dr. Phil, and especially... Boy, that Obama is pretty amazing. Oh man, I can't remember how to say his first name now. These Germans have been butchering it all week. I better read his mind to find out. Excellent. Secret Service told me to only be here for 10 seconds, so lift the hand, receive the applause, lifting hand, right hand, always a powerful hand, scan stage left, move to middle, scan stage right. I am not a robot, but I've done this so many times. Who are these people, and what is for lunch? I am starving. But keep smiling, keep smiling, otherwise Michelle will be upset. Keep smiling, keep smiling. Here we go. He didn't say it. That's okay. I'll get it. I'm sure I can remember. And a special thank you to Barack Obama. I mean, Barack Obama. Oh, no. That was awful. But he doesn't seem that phased at all. What a class act. Okay, now he's coming over to thank me. He was a handshake guy, wasn't he? It's so hard to tell these days. I am so tall. I'm sure I was being interviewed by someone, but I can't seem to see him. Oh, here he is down there. Oh, see the man. See, now, what was his name? What? Oh, that's right. It was Dan. Dan, Dan. Correct. I hope I got it right. I'm still being mic'd. Uh, don't say anything inappropriate. Let's just go in for that formal handshake. Okay, he is definitely going in for the handshake. I don't have to worry about it. We are going to handshake. <laughs> Well, this Dan guy seems pretty cool, almost like a brother to me, and, uh, you know, what I do, it's what I'm infamous, let's get one of those infamous shots of Obama being relatable, Obama being friendly, Obama being one with the people, let's get the fist bump out, here we go, fist out, bam! Oh no, he switched up on me, what do I do? What's he doing? Oh no, he's coming for that grab! Does this guy not get a fist bump? Is he going to put his hand over my... F no, this is going to be a disaster. Maybe I should go in for the punch. That would be a lot more friendly. How long should I hold his presidential fist in my hand? I got to bring this guy close to me. This is already so awkward, but let's go in for the man hug right now on stage. I'm now experiencing the presidential hug. His arms are so strong which is so surprising how strong and comforting this hold is. I could live here forever. 
cannot get this thought out of my head. He just seems like one of these cute little teddy bears that you would tickle. But to 8,000 people watching, but I am curious, where can I tickle this guy? Well, I hope he's not thinking what I hear he's thinking. I should not have had that fifth glass of water, but the cucumber in the water makes it so fresh and delicious. Is he urinating? What is happening? Michelle is not going to be happy with me at all. Thank you so much for listening to Sketch Comedy Podcast Show, lovingly produced in Portland, Oregon. If you enjoyed the show today, I would love it if you helped me out in one of two ways. The first one's free. Just share the show on social media or write a review on wherever you listen to your podcasts. That would be so helpful and so wonderful, and it costs you nothing. The other way you can support the show is financially, and I'm just going to give you a little behind the scenes. Uh, There is no money in podcasting. I do this, and it costs me money to do it. It's a passion project. But if you'd like to help offset those costs, which I would really appreciate, please head over to patreon.com and to reward you for as little as a dollar a month, you'll get all of the bonus material. And let me tell you, in this episode, there was a ton of things that did not make it into the episode that were still incredibly interesting. And now for the fun part. Sketch Comedy Podcast Show is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. If you'd like to use this work in any way, please contact the show and request permission. Look, life is made up of stories. Find interesting people, have an intriguing conversation, and improvise an adventure all of your own. <laughs>